Okay, here's the PowerPoint. OLI module 15 is about hypothesis testing. That corresponds to module 15 in the workbook for our class as well. This is topic one in our workbook for module 15 on identifying hypotheses. And we have some stories, some word problems, where we'll need first step will be to decide between a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. Now, what do I mean when I say hypothesis? And what kinds of hypotheses will we test? So in general, a hypothesis is just a proposition or an educated guess that's to be tested by comparison against data. In this class, the hypothesis to be tested is always just that a random variable would be found to have some specific distribution if we could just get access to the entire population. Maybe the population's infinite. So it's an educated guess or a theory or a hypothesis about what the distribution would be. We're, we're limited to that. We can only have these guesses because we do not have access to the entire population. Now, where does your hypothesis come from? I mean, I say an educated guess, but it usually comes up from somewhere. There might be a scientific theory. There are lots of um, hypotheses about distributions of variables in physics and statistical mechanics. Um, or they might just be made up guesses. It doesn't matter because either way, they're going to be tested against data to see if they're consistent with what we really observe. So an experimenter collects data to find out if the data is distributed in a manner similar to what the hypothesis would predict. Now, What's the null hypothesis of an experiment? So for any given experiment, there's one hypothesis called the null hypothesis, and the experiment is designed to challenge that, to give it the opportunity to be wrong. And the null hypothesis has some attributes that you can use to identify it in a word problem. Unburdened and customary. So in the absence of strong evidence to the contraries, consumers of the research, people who read your paper, will continue to use the null hypothesis because it's the current best approximation to the truth. The null hypothesis does not bear the burden of evidence. It's what your reader already believes. And the null hypothesis has to be very specific. Like in this class, it's often just, it's our hypothesis that some particular variable is normally distributed or has some other specific shape. And maybe we, we assume, or part of our theory is that it has a particular mean and a particular standard deviation. Why does the null hypothesis have to be so specific to include things like the shape and the mean and the standard deviation to really pin down? Well, when we get around to compare the null hypothesis against data, we need to be able to calculate some probabilities. We need to be able to calculate the probability that what we observed in our data would occur if the null hypothesis was true. Because the null hypothesis is so specific, it's going to conflict with the data to some degree. They're not going to be perfectly compatible. So that's what I mean by hostile to data because of its specificity. 
Now, the alternative hypothesis is often just logical negation of the null hypothesis. It's whatever you think must be the case if the null hypothesis is wrong. So the null hypothesis might be, well, I think human temperatures are normally distributed with a mean of 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit, a standard deviation of 0 0.7 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll just continue believing that until you show me some evidence to the contrary. But the alternative could be simply, no, that's not right, uh-uh. The alternative hypothesis, it does not have to be so specific. It, it does not bear, I mean, it bears the burden of proof because whoever believes the null hypothesis will just continue believing it. The alternative hypothesis, you're trying to collect data to show the alternative, to attack the null hypothesis. So the alternative bears the burden of proof, and it's novel. It's something, it's something different that would represent a, a change away from the existing null hypothesis. And it can be very general. You don't have to use it to calculate any probabilities. So it can just be, uh-uh. And because it's so broad, it's more likely to be compatible with, with data. And so it's, it's general and friendly to data. Here's an example. The Environmental Protection Agency reports that the exhaust emissions for a certain car model has a normal distribution with a mean of 1.45 grams per mile of nitrous oxide and a standard deviation of 0 0.4 grams per mile. Okay, but then the car manufacturer claims their new process reduces the mean for this car model. Some data is collected. You get a simple random sample of 28 cars of this particular model, and you measure their exhaust, and the sample mean turns out to be 1.21 grams per mile. So in this story, there are two hypotheses and one fact. The hypotheses are always about the population, but the fact, the evidence, just comes from a sample. The hypotheses are just theories. The evidence is an actual fact, but since it's just about the sample, it may or may not be the truth about the whole population. So here's the null hypothesis in this example. It's the blue statement where the EPA gives this their current existing belief about the distribution. And you can tell it's a hypothesis. It's not a fact because it's about the whole population. You can tell it's very specific because you've got everything you need to know to calculate probabilities. It's telling you the, exactly the distribution. And it does not bear the burden of proof because the EPA has already reported this and they'll just continue to believe it until you can show them evidence otherwise. So that's why this one is the null hypothesis and we use this symbol H with a little zero underneath to stand for the null hypothesis. The, the, the number null is just an old fashioned word for the number zero. Now, here's the other competing theory in the story. The car manufacturer claims their process reduces the mean level of exhaust. It's a hypothesis again, 
because it's about the whole population. But it's not specific, it's general. They just say the mean is lower, but they don't say what it is in particular. So there's a whole range of possibilities compatible with this statement. But it's not specific enough to be the null hypothesis. And it does bear the burden of proof. Because the EPA will not believe it unless the car manufacturer produces some evidence. So this is the alternative hypothesis. And so this H with a subscript A, it stands for the statement over here. It stands for the red statement, so you don't have to keep writing it out over and over again. So it's, it may be unusual to you to see a a mathematical symbol. When you see a symbol like this in the past, maybe it's always stood for a, a number or a function or a set. And here it's standing for a logical statement. It stands for all those words written in red. Okay. So the manufacturer went out and got some real data so this, this green statement is the evidence that they are presenting. It's not a hypothesis. It, it actually happened. They, it's a fact. And it's not about the population. It's about this one sample. Now, it's lower. The EPA said 1.45 grams per mile. And here this data says 1.21 grams per mile. So it makes you think the EPA might be wrong, but you don't, you're not sure. The EPA might say, well, you just got lucky. You know, pick, pick another 28 cars and maybe next time you'll see we're right. And so that's why it becomes a probability question. We have to decide, is the difference big enough well, the EPA has to decide, is the difference big enough to convince them? All right. So right now, you know, before we even get into that whole question of how much difference is significant, right now we just are going to look at some stories and practice identifying the hypotheses. And there'll be some homework examples for that, where you kind of follow this one we just went through. So just a little bit on notation, so you can write down your answers. So here's our story about the EPA and the manufacturer. And the question the story at the moment is just, so you let X be the emissions of a randomly selected car, and your problem is to use symbols to write down the null and alternative hypotheses. And so here's some a new kind of notation that you can use to abbreviate these things. So Here's our null hypothesis. HO is that X is normal, mu is 1.45, and sigma is 0.4. It's just taking that whole blue statement and removing most of the words and just leaving, leaving what it tells us about the distribution. And then the alternative hypothesis is just, no, mu is less than that. The population mean mu. And then the fact is, well, here's a sample mean from one particular sample one day. And that's it. The idea of hypothesis testing is that when we say, the EPA says 
population means 1.45. We say our sample was smaller. They say you just got lucky. We need to be able to do a probability calculation so that we can respond to them. We say, well, you say we just got lucky, but uh, how lucky do you think we must have gotten? Because we'd have to be pretty darn lucky to get such a big difference. So if that probability, that p-value, is really small, then the EPA would say, okay, well, I guess you probably didn't get lucky. It's okay. They might have to give up their null hypothesis. That's it.